So we are in public session. So uh, the topic in, in this session is the current threat of extinction of one third of the Irish native bee population and related matters. Um, so we are going to discuss that and I am pleased to welcome from the Federation of Irish Beekeepers Association, Mr Ken Norton, PRO, the President, uh, Paul O'Brien and one of the beekeepers, um, Peter Walsh. Um, but before I ask you to address the meeting, I have to uh, draw your attention to the fact by virtue of Section 17.2L of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to this committee. However, if you are directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to do so, you are entitled thereafter only to a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings to be given and you are asked to respect the parliamentary practice to that effect, that where possible you should not criticise nor make any charges against any person, 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 persons or entity by name in, or in such a way as to make him or, or it identifiable. I, will all, I also wish to advise that, you, that the opening statement and any other documents you have submitted to the committee may be published on the committee website after this meeting. Members are reminded of the long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that they should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person outside the houses or an official by either by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. So, Mishglem er Ketoig Tosnu, to whom Paul O'Brien come. Paul O'Kean, is it? No, Paul O'Brien, President of the Federation of Irish Beekeepers. Tosnu Ganas. Uchtaran, Paul O'Brien. Thank, thank you for allowing us to speak here today. Uh, during the 1960s and the 70s, Ireland was known as the land of milk and honey throughout the world. In 2019, we still produce milk, but not, not, not much honey. Over the years, much of our uplands and hedgerows have disappeared, and we seldom see, very seldom see wildflower meadows anymore. All these changes have seen a reduction in the amount of wild native bees, at a time when we should be ensuring greater protection of the vulnerable insects. As Ireland prides itself as a green island with wild tourism and green agriculture, we should be more protective for nature in our country. At a time when all wildlife, including bees, need all the help they can get, it is now a time for us all to sit together and discuss concerns about managing our uplands and hedgerows and come up with a positive solution to minimise the conflict with nature. I'll speak from the heart. We have a major problem at the moment with the decline of not only our habitats, our plant and fauna, our bees, our birds and our wildlife. And as citizens of Ireland and citizens of the world, we are given the land by way of, by way of a loan from preceding ancestors. And we must hand it back to the next generation in as good as we got it without destroying it any further. Ireland prides itself on its green image and yet our habitats are disappearing, whereas before we could keep 60, 70 beehives, as elderly beekeepers have told me up and down the country, they cannot keep that many more because there's no food. The hedgerows are protected, but there's no stipulation on how the hedgerows are to be cut. And the habit has started in Ireland where they're cutting them right down to the root and then using mechanical diggers and machines to split the roots, which doesn't allow the hedgerows to grow back. Now, Chagas has been very supportive with the Federation of Irish Beekeepers, and we brought out a good document last year together on how to manage and cut hedgerows. But as there's no legislation, the, again, mechanical diggers are removing the hedgerows and they're not growing back. If we lose the insects, we lose the birds, we lose the green image. The canary in the mine was brought down years ago, and when it died, we knew we had to get out of the mine. The bees are dying, they're telling us something. If we don't listen, we're letting down the future generations. Thank you. Colonel Margaret, Erwala Indanella, Rodora. Does anybody want to say anything else? So I'll ask the committee members and their last question. So any of you can kind of an answer just in the case, Colonel Margaret. So Kate Tardis. Um, gentlemen, thank you very much for coming to the committee here today and um, we have your how to guide here in front of us as well. 
Um, I think it's, it's well accepted, the, the points that you're making here today, I suppose, about our biodiversity and how we, ha we are the custodians of the land. Um, and we, ha we have a huge responsibility to hand it on to the next generation. Um, and of course, the bees are a huge part of that biodiversity. So I'm just wondering, in terms of us as a committee, um, and I'm asking very frankly and very honestly, I mean, apart from what we can do as individuals with our own gardens and preserving meadows and stop cutting our grass and stop cutting our hedges and all of that, what, is, what can we do as, as a committee to, I suppose, further the plight that you come to this committee with today in terms of the bees themselves as one aspect of the biodiversity of our country? Thank you for your question. What we'd ask you all to do is, we have this act about the hedgerows and how they're cut and managed. Mm. What we'd ask you now is to bring in the next round of legislation to say that they cannot be cut to, the, to an inch of their life. That there should be a guidelines, a, a, a document, if not law, that they cannot be removed right down to the root where they have, have no chance of growing again. So mm. a, a criteria to, as to how to cut them and not to let them be cut without that criteria, because it's been destroyed. Uh, we'd also ask you to, to curtail the use of pesticides. They're being used because some gardeners might have a couple of dandelions, so they bring out the best chemical in the world that they think is Roundup and other chemicals of that nature, neonicocides. But the damage they do is unbelievable. We'd also, we have a good working relationship with the farming community. We do ask them to notify the beekeepers in their area when they go spraying, because we know they have to spray. We accept all this. Mm. But if they tell us when they're doing it in the daytime, we can put the bees in for that day, close the door on them, not let the bees out. Mm. They won't come in contact with the pesticides, they won't die, mm. and they'll survive. Mm. But there's no legislation asking them or inviting them to tell us. These are little areas where a little incentive. Now, I know the farmer has to make money, and the landowners have to make money, so the next round of cap reform or agricultural payments, it could be put into the stipulation that hedgerows are protected to a, a certain criteria, that spring is a notifiable to the beekeepers in their area. We have 63 associations in the country. It would take one email shot to tell that here, Mr. Brown or Mrs. Brown is going to spray the area tomorrow morning, mm -hmm. and the beekeepers in that area could protect their livestock and their bees. Mm -hmm. They're simple little things, but they won't do it on their own. Yeah. So they're going to need a gentle push or an encouragement, yeah. whichever is the norm. So it's about opening up those lines of communication and recognising the bees almost, your, your farmers, your custodians of the bees and having that communication with you locally on the ground. Yes, but will... they need that incentive, whether yeah. it's a financial incentive or a carrot or a stick, whichever, mm -hmm. and that's as you as legislators, we'd ask you to encourage one of the two, whichever it is, mm -hmm. to make sure that they, they're small things, mm -hmm. they're simple to do. You know, a little pamphlet that says you can't cut the hedge beyond these limits or this size of that structure. And if you're spraying, please notify the farmers that's something you need to do. And it's a small incentive. Uh, we also need, uh, we also need uh, the All Ireland uh, Pollinator Plan to be adopted by as many county councils as possible. Now, one example would be County Loud, they have adopted it fairly recently. and. All the roundabouts are now turned into a wildflower meadow, mm -hmm. which is helping all sorts of pollinators, so it's an excellent idea. Plus, we should be encouraging the tidy towns competitions, mm -hmm. tidy towns participants, to get more involved in the All Ireland Pollinator Plan, because as we said before, or as you know yourself, 75% of what we consume needs to be pollinated, not necessarily by bees, but by some pollinator. So if we stop doing that, um, shall we say, if all the pollinators die tomorrow, we, it's not a question that we would die. We would then be left with 25% of stuff which doesn't need to be pollinated. So we would end up with a very limited diet. So we would die eventually, or rather quicker, because we would be left with a limited diet, so we'd be getting sick more often and so on. So we need to protect the 75% which we're talking about. Before Senator O'Donnell comes in, will you explain what yes. the, the All-Ireland Pollinator Plan is? Sorry, yeah, the All-Ireland Pollinator Plan was uh, drafted up in uh, 2015, which runs to 2020. So it was um, put together in connection with the National Biodiversity Data Centre. So the Federation, which is ourselves, would be one of the signatures to it, Board B. Uh, Department of Agriculture, Food and Marine, um, plus the Heritage Council. 
So there are various other organisations which are funded by the government um, which would be involved. So what happens is um, they would go around to various events, so would we, um, explaining about hedgerows for pollinators, uh, creation and management of a wildflower meadow, creating wild pollinator nesting habitat, plus getting the farming community involved to plant more plants and flowers on the farmlands. So it's, it's to encourage everybody to get involved. Uh, this is the whole thing. Now, there's also the initiative has been rolled out into schools and colleges as well. So there's a junior version, uh, there's all sorts of versions, and you can go onto the website, pollinator.ie. So most of the stuff is all free. They can download it, print it out, or you can get a hard copy as you wish. So that would be the main issue we would be having, that if it can be promoted more. Um, initially, when it came out first, it was in papers every day of the week, on the television, all the sort of thing. But obviously, like everything then, funding ran out. So it's now just pops up every now and again. Uh, but it's still, it needs to be in the, in the public's face, shall we say, so as they can see what to do. Don't cut your grass every two minutes. It's not a football bitch that you have. Let your weeds grow. They're a benefit to some insect. So yeah, that, yeah. Chair, can I just ask a question, Ken? That's a five-year plan you, you talked about there, the National Pollination Plan. It is, yeah. And we're coming to the end of it, obviously. Oh, yeah. So have there been any deliverables in that? Sorry? Has, has there been any sort of tangible deliverables that you can say, Gee, Oh, there has been, yeah. There has been a lot of uptake on it, you see. But um, the main issue, I would say, is if the, if the, if the local county councils would pick up on it. Push it. It'd be a huge benefit. And, ha and, and is your, now, is some your of them sense have, that they haven't been? Some of them have. Now, it's it's very limited the, uh, the amount that have picked up on it. Okay. So we would need as many as possible to pick up on it. Okay. Well, just let me ask a few questions, and if they come across as remedial, forgive me, but it's really for to get to the root of some of this. How bad are we in Ireland in relation to what you're talking about? Where do we fare? That's the first question. You know, where do, where, where do we fare? Maybe we'll just ask the, answer them one by one because they're quite disparate, Chair. Um, how bad are we in relation to other countries? Are we faring anywhere, bottom of the line or middle of the way or in relation to what you're, all, what you're talking about, which is the preservation, really, of our land, as you say, and of our environment? At the, at the moment, we, we have probably the best hedgerows still in existence. In existence. In existence. But the, the rate of destruction, for want of a strong word. And who is responsible for that, Paul? The, well, uh, the, the Chagas have worked tirelessly with, with the farming community and have, as I said, with us as well and the pollination plan to bring out a, a, a booklet on how to manage hedgerows, correct, hedgerows correctly. But the trouble is the farmers in the best will in the world, are using the opportunity, as I said, to cut the hedges right down. They cannot recover from that. Now, they have the profitability of getting as much pasture land going to get the dairy industry going, and they want to get every square inch of it. Unless there's an incentive, maybe in the CAP programme or somewhere like that, there's an incentive back to give them back. As we had discussions outside, there was a thousand acre farm up the country, and for him to give back the linear acre, which would be the hedgerows, he'd be losing two or three acres, or maybe ten acres out of his thousand. And he couldn't do it. He just is not, it's not profitable enough for him to do that. So this is what we're up against. Uh, the county councils, uh, only very few of them have taken the pollination plan on board and have brought it. Very few of very them, few yes. Them. Have, have done what? Taken the pollination board, uh, plan yeah, You on mentioned board. County Loud, so some of them have been very slow. Some of them are very, very slow and have kind of ignored the matter, totally. There's, like, there's no planting of like, Because surely that would be, Paul, the place to start, because the county councils are the locale. We are kind of sitting here representing a lot of things, I personally, legislation. But would that not be the place to start? Or are they ignoring you, or are they well, just they, being lazy? They're being lazy. They have all received this. They've all been made presentations, too, about the pollination plan, but they're being lazy. And I don't disregard that you are the public face. People hear it in CE quite often. And you, you are the legislators, so you are the encouragement. You can pass it down. We've tried from the bottom up, but we need to get the top down as well to get people to get involved. So what do you think that, as a legislator, I should do now? I'd like to see 
guidelines, either, as I said, with a carrot or a stick, about the managing of hedgerows, not the total destruction of them. This is a huge problem up and down the country. And did this come up on the doors of the of the of the um, the local elections? Because we had the Greens everywhere, so we, at least we, it was a. You, we have, and let's be honest. Everywhere you read, look now, you're hearing about the humble bumblebee and the honeybee. We have get we have got into the press, but there's only so much we can do by publicising it. Okay, that, that's the first question. Um, just tell me what happens if we've no bees. Well, if, if the I'm bees just decrease and decrease and decrease, very, just, just, just line very, it down. It's very, very simple. You go into your local supermarket tomorrow morning, and every single fruit and veg that you see with a colour is, is pollinated by a pollinator. And bees are dedicated. When I say bees are dedicated, let's take a field of oilseed rape. Uh, the bees will be come out of their hive and they'll spot the isle seed rape and they'll say, lovely, they'll spot the, they'll spot the isle seed rape yeah. and say, that's a lovely source of food. Every single bee will continuously go back to them flowers till they're fully exhausted of nectar. So they are dedicated pollinators. A bumblebee will come along and say hello to a flower and go to the next field and the next field. Honeybees go all the time back to the same food source till it's exhausted. That's why they're their primary pollinators. Now, if you go back into your supermarket, there's no bees, all the coloured fruit and veg is gone. So when you say pollinator, what exactly do you mean? Bumblebees, wasps and well, honeybees. What, what are they doing? They're going from one flower to the next flower, bringing pollen from one flower to the next flower and fertilising all the rest. Fertilising? Fertilising. See, some time people use this language, but they don't actually understand the, I the, 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 the breath. Yes. the breathing of what the actual bee does yes. for us to come along and eat it. The reward for the bee is nectar and the nectar is a very fine sugar solution dissolved in maybe 80% water. When they bring it back to the hive they hydrate it right down to 20% of water mm. which gives us the honey that we all delight. Mm. And when you said that 75% is, uh, uh, is pollinate, what, what, you said 75% pollination. Of the food. Eh? The food that we eat out of the yeah. soup. Give me another example. Orange is gone, banana is gone, tomato is gone, strawberry is gone, all of them gone. Your, your diet would be very simple, it would be cabbages, mm. Uh, mm. root vegetables mm. and wheat. Mm. Very interesting diet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. You see, kind of, yeah. Um, do you think, when I was saying earlier on, because of the way we have dest are destroying our environment, if you start with plastic and the seas and the effluent recently in Dublin South where people can't swim now because all the poo is going into the sea and et cetera, et cetera. Do you think that I'm crazy uh, if I was to say that we really need a natural environment single department now because of the destruction that we have that would encompass what you're talking about as well? Well, it's very simple. If you go out over the last year, who are the people on the street that are so passionate at the moment? It's the children. Mm. They don't want us to hand back an environment that's destroyed. And we are in charge. Every one of us, as anybody over the age of 30, is responsible for what happened in the past. Now, we can't do, go back over the Industrial Revolution. We have to look after what we have today. You're of the same vintage as I am. And when you drove across the country many years ago, your windscreen was covered in insects. You can drive from here to Galway and you might see two insects. Mm. We've been we certainly won't see them on your windscreen, which is where you used to no, see them. Yeah. We've been excellent at removing all the insects. We're doing a great job of it, but we have to stop. You see, people live in a kind of a contradictory environment too, because they drive across Ireland, you know, and they think, my God, look at Ireland, it's magnificent and it's green and it's emerald and it's all of that. And they don't lock in sometimes to the reality of what you're saying, because they don't really think that these pollinators are essential to what we eat and who and how we eat. Every single thing that we live with is essential. If you take out one snail or one bee or one bird, it has a catastrophic effect on other mm. animals. Look at the report yesterday about the diversity of plants and fauna. It's disappearing. Mm. So we can stop one thing today. We can mm. help it to, to assist it. But do you not think it should be a prerequisite of all county councils that they answer what you're saying, not just laws, but that other county councils, they, that it should be a statutory requirement that they answer what you're suggesting I think, here. I think it should be a statutory requirement that they do incorporate in their planting and in their landscaping and in their planning commissions, somewhere along that, uh, respite or oasis for, for pollinations and for birds and bees. Mm. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, Thank you, a number of questions myself, so if you want to come back after that. Um, 
I, 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 I think it would be useful for us if kind of we had a list of the county councils and that that have signed up to it, um, and it might be useful on your website if it's not already there to I highlight, um, because that allows the young people you're talking about and those of us who are passionate uh, to put pressure on councils, kind of all of us are in political parties, well, some, some aren't, but we, our colleagues to say, kind of, we need the council to act and that they can use their uh, new mandate to try I'd, and... I'd it. undertake to do that. Yeah, s s second of that, um, there's a, a, in the city here, there's a lot of, uh, well, there is a movement towards a lot more allotments. So, for instance, my own area, Bluebell, I've only just opened one. I got my keys last week. I haven't done anything. But with that, it's an area that obviously is encouraging people to grow. But unless, in my view, unless you have uh, hedges around it or um, encourage bees in, kind of, you, you can kind of be, have all the will in the world. But if it's in the middle of a built-up area and everybody is killing off the, the flies, the wasps, the bees, and whatever. And by fly by sprays and that, you're not going to have as good or an abundance of crop. So again, I know in my area, one of the things I was thinking about and came up with discussion with some of those who are on the allotments is to try and get the council to uh, encourage in the the, the the hedge or the fencing around these allotments to grow kind of uh, colourful flowers from that to try and draw draw um, wild bees in. Um, so it's, it's something that we could do. One of the things in the pollinator plan is the, the, the trees and the bushes to plant. Yeah. There's no point in planting trees that are just green leaves. Uh, it's you know, Scotch pine is no good yeah. anyway. It's ones that have some benefits. So I think it was yourself, Ken, mentioned about the funding, or somebody mentioned the funding running out. Yeah. Um, so kind of have you made a submission looking for an additional wad of money to continue the work because I, I, I looked in preparation for this at some of the, 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 the documents yeah. you have produced and they're, right. they're, they're very useful they are, yeah. uh, uh, somebody who's uninitiated if you want um, and simple steps so I'd encourage people to go on to the, the pollinators.ie site and yeah. have a look at the guides but well, the, I'll give you the few guidelines yeah. the Federation of Irish Beekeepers we get 8,000 euros a year from the government yeah and we have three 8,000 Eight thousand to do their work, and we have three and a half thousand members, and all of us here are all voluntary. We don't get right. we, we so, give our time for it. So again, kind of yeah. Sorry, you see, the Ireland yeah. pollinator plan. You see, that's mainly being run by the National Biodiversity Data, uh, Data Centre. So we are in partnership with them, are our several others. However, they're the top dog, shall we say? So they would be seeking the funding. But we would be supporting them, but they would be seeking the main funding. Yeah, but given the it. crisis we're in, kind of the organisations who are best placed to give advice to farmers, to schools, to whatever, right. need to be funded, whether it's yourselves or the yeah, National yeah, Biodiversity correct. Plan or whomever, the funding, in my view, has, has to be given. Um, the, the, the other point I had, yeah, it's, 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 it's something that I don't know whether there has been much, and we had discussed it here, um, board them own a lot of their bogs, and there are other bogs which aren't belonging to them or no longer being cut. Um, has there been much work to encourage um, the, the, the flowers or the, the ferns and, uh, and whatnot to be grown again to encourage? Because More those areas have good. They have approached us, and they want us to get involved in the, in the replanting of a lot of the bogs and all yeah, that. Yeah, because that's, uh, that's an area that's very yeah, important, I yeah, think. We, so because that'll be a big belt of land in the middle of the country. If we could be bring it back into that habitat, it'd be wonderful. Yeah, no, and again, I think you draw up the plan, kind of, and if if you need kind of our good officers here in the committee or politicians in general. Um, the, you know, in, in, in the main, I think people understand. They might not be fully aware and they might not understand the full consequences, but I think you, you, you have supporters there. And at the very least, I can talk for the people on this committee who have expressed an interest. Um, we, we will have Boards Watch Ireland in, kind of a, a, in a number of weeks as well. Uh, and it's again, there's an understanding on this committee, um, and I think in general in the population, that there's, there's a crisis point. So we either take action now 
So where the state, because it's not just Border Mona, there's also the national parks, kind of there are, like Phoenix Park and all of those areas, and, and you, you mentioned meadows uh, and the likes, um, ha, to, you know, to allow areas to, to grow wild in some ways. And some of it I've seen outside my own house, there's a, there's a park cross away, and I always wondered why they didn't cut the grass. Now you know why. And yeah. now I understand. Yeah. But to give credit kind of, to the OPW and Board yeah. Beer, they've been very supportive of us. So, kind of, it's, it's a matter of explaining it to the rest of the population so that they understand, and, I, and that's where I think the funding needs to happen so that it can be explained. Can I ask uh, Peter, he wants to say a few words, because yeah. he's the longest beekeeper among the lot of us here. Just to say a few words uh, on him. Uh, Peter Welch is my name. I'm still the Kenny Beekeepers Association, and I started to beekeep in 1959. That's a good way to go. Now, with that, I just want to tell you, you asked the question how bad the thing has got since then. Beekeeping from about that up to the year 2000 has been fairly steady. Now, I had 24 hives of bees, stocks of bees in my apiary up to then. And, you know, I was doing okay by them. And there were plenty of food, there were plenty of foraging there. And uh, I now have six. I can only keep six. It just goes to show you what's after happening. Where I was keeping 24, it's steadily, steadily going down, down, down. Now, as I said, it's all right for me, we'd say, as a beekeeper, to say that, oh, well, uh, this area is only is cater for six stocks, where it was 24. I'll put the balance in my car and I might get a, a, an apiary from you or an apiary from the gentleman alongside you there are from the chairman and I'll spread them out. Mm. But the bumblebee or the, or, 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 or the uh, solitary bee, they, they can't get into a motor car and drive off t t 20 miles down the road where they're a good area. They're going to be gone, gone. I'm passionate about this. We are Steadily, I count bumblebee. One of the things I was asked to do in 1957, 58, 59, when I was at school, I was taught by uh, Mr. Dorn. He was the, he was the man that that founded Machana Tuha, which was the forerunner to, to the farmers' law. He was the man that founded it. He gave me a project to do on bees, and he said, because I had no land, he used to give. People with farmers' land, they might rear a calf and he would start them off. I had no land, nothing. So he said, OK, he said, I'll give you a job counting bumblebees, which I did. I'm counting bumblebees since. And I, whilst I was getting around on a certain hedgerow at a certain time, I have photographs in Van Emerton, uh, I can see that bumblebees have gone down by about 70%. We're in serious, a serious problem. I'll tell you how valuable they are. I want to respond to this lady over here. She asked two questions. How valuable they are. In, in, in uh, the spring of, of 2016, which, uh, 2016, which is only two years ago, I had a phone call from a gentleman in Kilkenny. Uh, Hughes was the man's name. He, and he, I don't know, I, I just, I was on the phone to him, and he said, uh, I, can you help me, he says. And I said, in what way? He said, can you send me up some bees? God, I said, we're after losing up to 70% of our bees because of lack of pollen over in, the, in the back end of 15, which was, which was a very cold back end and the, the start of 16. And I said, what's your problem? He said, I have 20 acres of pumpkins sold, sown in the ground. And there are men after coming in to me, he said, this is the farm I put down these pumpkins. There are men after coming in to me, and he said, have you got the bees to pollinate them? He didn't know they had to be pollinated. He didn't know. So I said, I'll get you a few hives of bees, but I can't get you much. I rang him, I rang him, uh, we'll say when the season was over at Christmas, and how did you get on? I got on well, he says. I got on well, but I have 100 acres, I'm going to send 100 acres from next year. I need some bees, he said. And he said, the bees, I had to get, import bumblebees down from Northern Ireland. And the bumblebee, he said, was 10 times better than the army bee that we had for that particular job. I said, that don't surprise me, because the bumblebee will pollinate at a lower temperature than, than our bees. 
Bumblebee will pollinate around 10. We would have to, our bees have to be up around 15, 16 before they can do any pollinating. And bumblebees are crucial. M Mr. Dorn told me that, God be good to him. In 1959, if anything happened to the bumblebee, we are in trouble. So you asked me a question uh, there about the Kilkenny. I went into Kilkenny County Council two years ago. I was the head of the posse. And I asked Kilkenny County Council about, about this pollinator plan. They hadn't adopted it. You're right, they hadn't adopted it. But they adopted it then. And I asked them to do something for me to highlight the whole uh, 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 situation. So they adopted the bumblebee, the black and amber bumblebee, as the insect for Kilkenny. And I asked them to do that, they took it on board and they have adopted it. Now I did say last year, uh, it's all right coming in and I'm gone and they have the bumblebee adopted, I want to see what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So they said they were going to put a plan in place, so I'm, I, I waited until the local election was over, I went to my councillor to know what have they done, like about various uh, verges along motorways and all that kind of a thing. There's a lot of work that could be done there. But if, some, if something is not done quickly, we're going to lose the whole lot. And once they're gone, remember, we have the power to destroy them. We have the power to eliminate them, but we haven't the power to get them back. And like I said to the, when I went up to Kilkenny County Council, I, I was, got a bit frustrated one day, I was going around talking to myself around, I said, I said, I'm only like a drop in the ocean. But I said, if all the drops may make up an ocean, and if everybody done a little, a little, it, it might be on the person with, with, the, with the hanging basket, leave a little bit of your, your garden, go wild, just grand, in, bring out your children and look at the bees and the butterflies. And without the, without the bees, without the, we'll have no birds, we'll have no nothing. So I'm delighted that to get the opportunity of, 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 of speaking here today, and I hope I answered your question, how, 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 how valuable those pollinators are to, to humans, to the humans. And I'm heartened because the people, I'm, 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 I'm afraid the people will say around the 40 and 50, they're not taking it serious, but the people below that in the schools are taking it very, very serious. I can tell you that. They're taking it very, very serious. And um, I uh, have certain uh, schoolmasters and coming along and um, ask me to give various, various talks. So I'm thankful, thank you very much for thank giving you. me the opportunity. Thank you for the passion it's a, a, well, and, and an understanding of our responsibility. And it's a, it's a pity now, kind of maybe uh, Kilkenny will do better now with oh, well, their, after adopting in their hole and you know, after adopting the old symbol of the black and amber well, if, kind if, of be. <laughs> I'll, I'll give up the hurling if, if, we, if we can save the bumblebee. Okay. And I, I'll, ask the, I'll ask the gentleman over there, he might be able yeah. to. I, 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 I think just to fast track it, we might undertake to write to the councils yeah. here ourselves so that the committee will write asking them what action have they taken. If, if, uh, and anything, any practical steps like that, that we, you think we can take, um, I'm willing as a chair to put that to the members over, over the next while. So if, if you're coming across a stumbling block and you think our intervention would be useful, just ask. Okay. And, I, and I think that's uh, 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 not as much as we can do, but the least that we can do. No, we're, um, we're very it, would, very it, it would certainly help ignite you know, the very interest that you're trying to ignite, if we could help you get them, you know, to ignite their interest in it and make sure that, that it's happening. I mean, if Louth can do it so well, as you suggest, um, uh, Ken, if they can do it so well, why can't others, you know? And it's all very well to adopt a plan, but that can be in language, but you have to adopt it in action as well. So I, I would be very much in favour of that chair. I yeah. allow Deputy yes. uh, because I have to go very soon, and I want to get a photograph again with yourselves, kind of just beforehand, so on talk to Quaive. Before now, it's kind of something else. Um, I have a few questions. My understanding is looking at the documentation you provided that, and what was said to me when you were coming in, 
that in parts of the country, cutting of hedgerows is a major issue. Now, where I live, particularly where I live in the west of Ireland, but in large swathes of the west of Ireland, in fact, there's very, very little hedgerow cutting, and any hedgerow cutting is quite cursory. It's along the roads, it's done by the County Council, it's not the inside hedges, and it's only on the outside of the outside hedges, and it tends to be more vertical than lateral. And certainly, even in the time I've been in Cornamona, there's a lot more hedges in the west of Ireland, a lot higher hedges than there were previously. And these tend not to be, they're, not, they're, they're um, deciduous, in other words, they're, or they're white thorn or the traditional hedges. And I think it's fair to say, if you drive, particularly this year was a great year for white thorn, you drive the roads, the whole thing across the place of white thorn with plenty of gorse and there'll be more gorse than there ever was and so on. And in fact, there's more land disused uh, than there would have been 40, 50, 60 years ago. So I suppose the first question is, are we getting areas of the country that, if the hedgerows are driving, that the bees are thriving, right? And that's question number one. And question number two, I remember it being pointed out to me many years ago that the massive change in farming and farming balance and farming patterns from a multicultural approach in terms of doing a bit of sowing a Oats would have been popular, potatoes, uh, vegetables, people keeping some fruit and so on, just to producing grass and more grass and more grass, because that's what they were getting paid to do. Um, has, had, has that had a, a, a negative effect on what you're talking about? So what I'm saying is, in the areas where the hedges haven't been cut, to be large swathes of the country, large swathes of the country, and where actually you have a lot more cover now than you ever had, and you have a lot of more wild flowers not being cut, nothing being cut. Are we seeing that those areas are thriving in terms of bees, and that the areas where there's wholesale mechanical cutting by the farmers themselves, with sophisticated mechanical cutters that can cut every side of the hedge, up and down and across, are we seeing a difference in the number of bees in those areas? And as I said, the second thing is how much is the changing in farm practice having an effect? I'll answer that for you. Uh, thank you, Eamon. You were out of the room the first time. What's happened in the in the in the dairy belt, and the, from we'll say from Athlone to Cork and from that region of the country, is that the hedgerows are being cut down to, to the inch of their life. They're being taken right down to the rock to, to the stock root. And then the diggers are actually breaking the stock as they're doing it, and the hedgerows are not recovering. I also live in the west of Ireland, in the same town as yourself in Galway, and the hedgerows are good in Galway. The fields are good in Galway, but the wind coming off the sea keeps the bees busy trying to fly directly in a straight line. But I'm really talking about from Athlone to Cork and the dairy belt. But what I'm asking is, yes, I mean the wind was always the same, mm. and if anything, the cover's better now, right? Mm. And places like where I live are inland, they're not right in the sea. Well, yeah. the west of Ireland, uh, when I, I started... It to be population. It has to a degree. In our own association in Galway, we'd set up five years ago, we had 14 members. We now have 100 members. That's 100 new beekeepers have come into our area. So yes, technically, the bee population in the west of Ireland has increased, but that's down to the work that we're doing on the ground. But, but it, it, in other words, can you prove by comparing one against the other? The direct relationship between the hedge cutting that's going on yes, and the population of bees. In our area, we were able to. If you take a beehive, yeah. we count it by the number of supers as how much honey would come into that hive. Yeah. In the west of Ireland, we're still getting two or three supers per hive. Okay. When we get the right summer, like we've had last year, oh, this yeah, well, year. Always, always. But if you take Peter, who's down the, down the other end of the country, he might have had five or six supers on years ago. He's barely getting yeah. two. And, and the second question. Has the drift towards monoculturalism and absolutely, in you have vast tracts of grassland, 
and they're heavily um, uh, nitrogen and heavy manure, so it's just pure grass. There's nothing there. And if I was to say to you, if you were a bee and put yourself in a bee's shoes, you only can fly three miles to get food. And if you're flying over grass, which is no food, you suddenly starve. Now, can I make a suggestion, Chair? Because, you know, I think solutions are always more... One, by the way, on a side note, it's nothing to do with directly with bees, but it's interesting. I was out in Inish Boffin on the weekend, uh, and there'd been a significant revival in the concrete population on the islands off the west coast. Now, part of what caused their demise actually was the lack of farming when the islands became depopulated, and changes in farming practice as well. Um, in some cases, it was just pure depopulation, strangely enough. Um, but what we do see is a very significant revival. And I was listening to Red and the and they're apparently getting it done in Baden Nirtelig recently, the concrete making a comeback. So it shows if you change the circumstances, the game's not over because it. Now, one of the suggestions I would make that we would write to the Minister of Agriculture and CC the Agricultural Committee here, because I have wanted for years and years and years that as a special measure under what's now glass, what was reps and whatever, and this is all up for negotiation because after 2020 a new plan comes in, that instead of making it that the best money to be earned out of environmentally friendly farming was to put the thing in grass and do nothing and just keep the grass cut, uh, that in fact there would be a thousand or two euro paid to people to have kitchen gardens, in other words, to recreate more traditional diverse farming. Uh, and that you get paid. And with small mechanical devices, a lot of the hard labour can be taken out of having a half acre of spuds or vegetables or whatever. Uh, would it be a help if there was an environment? Like, to me, the environmental schemes we have, the glass schemes and so on, there are good features in them, but they tend to lead towards monoculturalism. Right? Because it's easier to get your money if it's simple. And what I wanted was that there would be a measure, just as they had the trading shoe measure where you injected the fertiliser and reduced fertiliser use, that there would actually be a specific measure for diversity in terms of crops. Now, I know that in the tillage areas, that they had these, uh, what do they call these areas that you set aside in? You let go set away. aside for bumblebees and areas yeah, of sand. Whatever. Well, what I'm saying in the other areas, we actually need a little bit of tillage or planting of various types. And uh, would you be supportive if we suggested in the new environmental programme it would be much more? Be very supportive of that. We'd also be very supportive of, uh, of what we have already, not to lose. Not to lose. Not to lose what we have. And I, I reiterate this: the hedgerows, yes, they have to be cut and managed, but they should not be, be removed. And we no, have no, no. photographic evidence of fields that were there three years ago. We wouldn't see that, as you know, in the West. Oh, no, no, the West is perfect, but let's, I'm going to give you what the other end of the country is. It's gone. <coughs> and and we, all we want is that to be saved, protected. And the only way to do that is bring out some kind of rules as to how to cut them, not to remove them. They're doing it by stealth. Anyway, but I agree with you. We, we need to open up the, the countryside to other, 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 other monocultures. So, I agree with Chair, I would suggest you to add to your list. We, we will look at that for the next meeting. Very good. Okay. Uh, and talk to Scanlon. Do you want to say a few words or ask questions? No? Deputy, Mur Deputy Murphy. Oh. <laughs> I know. That's, that's not correct. Okay. Well, there you are. Some more Chair, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to uh, hold, hold it up too long. It's just that uh, I was held up with other things and I just happened to see part of the debate from my office. And I think it's absolutely fantastic that within the confines of this house we are discussing such important issues. Now, one or two very short questions. Um, probably you've touched on them before, so I'll do it a short answer. I mean, I, I have a background in horticulture, so I know a lot about, well, I know a little about it, I won't say I know a lot, uh, about, about how important all of this debate about bees is. But the, the thing that really disturbs me out there is that so many people still laugh at you when you talk about the importance of the bee for human beings. And this is a huge problem. Now, we often see, you know, environmental ads about different things. And what about an awareness, an awareness campaign on TV and radio and social media about, 
you know, getting serious about the importance, particularly of the bumblebee. And Mr. Walsh, I heard you about the, the black and amber. I live in a town called Strokestown, and we have black and amber there as well. We don't call it Kilkenny, we call it Strokestown. But on a more serious note, to, um, you know, because there is, young people are great, the school's fantastic, the teachers are really good in the schools, but there is a problem with a lot of society who, who laugh at this and think it's, it's sort of, you know, airy-fairy stuff that we're discussing. So, I mean, I'm talking basically about awareness. How do you think we could improve it? If, if we could get the, the relevant department in government to fund a, an awareness campaign, would you think that would be a good idea? Absolutely. I'm going to answer this in two ways, to give a bit of positivity. When I started with the beekeeping, I might have been invited one school once every two years if I was lucky and I'd go in and they'd look and they'd get horrified when they see bees. For the last few years when I go, I always go to the eight-year-old classes, I do six schools in my district and when I go in the kids and the children are not terrified of bees, they know more about bees than I ever did at their age and they're hugely positive and they ring me and contact me about when they see a bumblebee or something wrong. So the positivity is there with all the youth have it, they understand it. We see them on the streets protesting about the earth and the climate. They're ahead of the game. We're only catching up as, as, as elderly adults, for want of a better word. We missed the game here a few years back. So they're very positive. This is the first time we've been asked to any uh, doll or, or Octus house to speak about the bees. So I thank you for that. That's the first chance ever. As I said to you, I represent three and a half thousand members of the Federation of Irish Beekeepers. It's a voluntary organisation and we get a pittance of 8,000 a year to keep it running. And we have to do all that. We do two surveys every year for the government and that's where most of our money gets robbed up. We don't have any bee health inspectors. We don't have any bee support inspectors. In England, you have bee supports. So instead of going to your vet, you go to your bee fella and say, hi, I've got a problem with the bees. They do that. Now, we do get free uh, testing from uh, the Department of Agriculture, pay for uh, health inspections on our bees. We send samples and that we used to pay for that. And this, the last two years, it's been free. So that's a slight positivity. But there's a lot of money coming into the country from, from research and everything else, but we don't get it on the ground. And as I said, 3,200 beekeepers, uh, each one would have up to three or four hives, and each hive is about 60,000 bees. So we're doing our bit. Uh, support? Yes, we do. This is the first opportunity to talk to government representatives at an equal level. We thank you for that. We'd like to get more media attention, but we don't know. As I said, we're voluntary. We try our best. Ken, fair play to him, is running around ragged. I used to do his, his job. And the late Philip McCabe, you've all met him, and God rest his soul, he's gone. He was the president of Apamonde, an Irish man. So we have, done, we have done our best, but we're hand-tied because we are a voluntary organisation and we're trying to get there. Okay. Chairman, I can't hold up any longer. Most of the okay. questions have been Cor asked. Thank Cor you very much. Cor 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 um, we can hear the passion. Thank you. I think in this committee, um, if you didn't understand before now, we understand now kind of how important it is. Hopefully today's session gets the publicity it deserves. You've laid it out quite well. Hopefully we will be able to impact on both the Agriculture Committee, Agriculture Minister and the Councils. Um, I presume that the next pollination plan is already in, in hand and kind of we will try and encourage um, whatever help can be given to you on that. Um, and hopefully um, you'll be able to come back to us uh, in a few years and tell us that we've managed to start or to address the decline at the very least and to start the increase but there, it, it, it will take a, quite a number of years I, I think and, uh, well, and uh, you have like great, to, great work. I'd like to ask you though, it'd be nice to come back here again next year and see how we progress with your help as well. We, we wouldn't have a problem kind of, uh, and we've encouraged, we, we're, we're just not sure whether we're going to be here next year. I'm here. Yeah, that's, that's, the nature, that's the nature of and this I don't, job. And I don't know if I'd be here, I well, don't know if I'd be elected. Um, we all have that problem. So, while I'm going to start short on the chin, I'm going to create new, I guess, while I'm going to start on the chin, I'm going to start on the chin, I'm going to start on the chin, I'm going to start on the Irish Federation of Irish Beekeepers Association. I don't thank you for your uh, contributions to the committee today, very valuable contribution. So the meeting is adjourned until Tuesday, March and Tarna Law the Yule, Tuesday the 2nd of July at 2 o'clock. Cora Mahogwit on Crinu Arat Law.